to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In the gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John chapter 14, verse number 6. We welcome you to our study of the gospel of John. John presents Jesus as God, as divine, and he backs that claim up with multiple proofs found throughout the life and the writing of the Gospel of John. As we think today about John's message, we want to put the Gospel account in its proper place in the New Testament. The New Testament breaks down uniquely into four categories. We have what we refer to as the Gospel account, the life of Jesus Christ, and that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These tell us who Jesus was, the life that He lived, the great statements that He made, and ultimately His death and His resurrection are depicted in these accounts. And then once we enter into that second stanza in the New Testament, we refer to it as the book of Acts, or is referred to as the book of Acts, and it tells us how to become a Christian. Now that I know who Christ is, found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts tells us how to become a member of Christ's body, a Christian. Then in Romans through Jude, that third category tells us now that you are a Christian, here's how to live every day as a child of God. It's about faithful Christian living. And then that fourth category would be the book of Revelation, which tells us how to die faithfully and victoriously as a child of God, even in the midst of suffering and persecution. Now, in that first category, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all unique in their scope and in their audience. Matthew is a Jew writing to Jews about the greatest Jew to ever live, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of David. He'll refer to Him as the Son of Abraham. And of course, the key idea is that He is King of the Kingdom. Mark is a little more unique in that Mark is a, a Greek or a Roman writing to Romans. He's a Roman writing to Romans about Jesus and His power and His majesty. Mark 7 verse 37, Jesus has done all things well. Luke kind of is writing to all people. He's given that ideal perspective of Jesus Christ and in Luke 2 verse 49, Luke says, Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and with man. Luke 2 verses 49 through 52. But John is unique in that he's writing to all men and women uh, of all races, all nationalities, with a very unique and specific purpose in mind. Here's the theme verse to the book of John. It's at the very end of the book, close to the end of the book, in John 20, verses 30 and 31. The book of John records this. Many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in His name. Why did John write this uh, gospel account? He wrote it to prove that Jesus is God. And friend, if the evidence supports that claim, and it does, that Jesus is God, then Jesus as God is able to give eternal life, is able to give hope and joy to every child of His. And so John takes a specific premise. Jesus is divine, and He doesn't follow 
a chronological account. He doesn't begin with the birth and work his way chronologically through the life of Jesus. John, based on that premise that Jesus is God, will pick out specific teachings or specific miracles or specific statements of Jesus to prove, to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. And so in this introductory lesson, we want to show as well that Jesus is God's Son. I want you to notice in the book of John how that Jesus is pictured as divine, as deity, by some of the titles or some of the ways that, that John addresses Jesus Christ. For example, here are some of the claims that John makes to the deity of Jesus. John 1 verse 14, John addresses Jesus as the eternal Word of God. Beginning in John 1 verse 1, the scripture says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now listen to this, and the Word was God. All right, whoever this Word is, John has already identified he's eternal, he was with God, and he is God. Well, who is this Word? John 1 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Who's John talking about? Jesus Christ. The Word with God, was God, uh, eternal in His nature, God Himself, the very Creator, He became flesh. That's Jesus. And so John claims that Jesus is that eternal Word of God. John also identifies Jesus by this title. John 1 verse 29, as John sees Jesus approaching, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's also identified in the book of John as the Messiah. For example, in John 1 verse 41, here's what John says about Jesus. Nathaniel, Andrew, and Simon Peter's brother, they found him, and here's what he said. He first found his own brother, Simon, and Andrew said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And so John identifies Jesus as that Messiah, as that one sent from God. The word Christ means anointed of God, as both prophet, priest, and king. And friend, when you read Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4, Jesus is all of those. He's the prophet God spoke through. He is that priest. He is God in the flesh. Hebrews 1, verses 9 and 10. John identifies him with another term that helps us to understand Jesus' claim to deity, and that is Son of God. John 1, verse 49, John clearly says, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Whatever God's Son is means He's also God. The Son of God would be God. And so throughout the book of John, you'll hear this. John 1 verse 49, He's referred to as the King of Israel. Uh, John 40 verse 42, or John 4 verse 42, He's the Savior of the world. And don't you remember the words of Thomas? Toward the end of the Gospel of John, uh, Thomas, who's also known as, the, known as the twin, he wasn't there when the Savior was resurrected. And so the others had told him about it. And he said, no, I'm not going to believe it unless I see for myself the nail prints in his hand and the sword print in his side. And Jesus held out his hands as it were. Here's the nail prints. Here's the sword print. What did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. And so throughout the book of John, the claim is made multiple times and in multiple places that Jesus is God. And friend, here's the practical aspect of that. If John can prove from the evidence in this gospel account that Jesus is God, there are serious ramifications to that. If He's God, He's our Creator. If He's God, He's going to be our judge. If He's God, He's worthy of our worship. And if He is God, then God came down to save man and His plan, John 14, 6, is the only plan that will save. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so let's think today for just a few moments as we introduce 
the Gospel of John about some of the evidence, the undeniable evidence that proves that Jesus is God. We begin by the seven signs. There are seven unique signs in the Gospel of John that will prove miracles that prove only God could do these things. Let's introduce those for just a moment. The first miracle is found in John chapter 2 about in verses 1 through 11. And in this miracle, Jesus and His mother and His disciples have been invited to a wedding at Cana. And while they're at the wedding, they run out of drink to serve the guest. And so Jesus' mother will ultimately appeal to Jesus to turn the water into wine. And Jesus does that. She tells the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. They're told to fill the pots with water when they take that liquid out of the pots to serve to the guest. It's the best, best wine, best grape juice they've ever had the privilege of drinking. Now, I want you to think about that. Water was put in. Jesus t changed one liquid form to another liquid form. He changed it from water to wine. How could that happen? How's this miracle possible? This is what even the guests said. Usually you save the inferior to the last when people have drunk well. You gave us the best at the last. Not only did he change water to wine, it was the best they'd ever made. Well, friend, how could you change one substance to another? More importantly, who has the power to put water in a glass or water in a pitcher and change that into the best wine or grape juice that ever drank? Nobody, here's the point, nobody today could do that. Men and women can't do that. There's only one answer to the question, who could do that? God. And friend, that's the point. The only way Jesus could take that water, 120 to 160 gallons of water, and turn it into best tasting wine or drink that ever had, was because Jesus has that power because He is God. These are the proofs John will give that Jesus absolutely is divine. Uh, let me mention some of the other miracles to you. For example, John 4, verses 46 through 54, there is a uh, nobleman's son who is sick. And this nobleman they can't cure him. They can't heal him. He's going to die if they don't do something. And so the nobleman and a few of his servants, they come to Jesus and they make the request, you don't even have to come, just say the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus didn't even go there. He just said the word that same hour the boy was healed. Didn't have to be present. Wasn't a doctor. Didn't do anything medically. To, what did Jesus do? He just said the word. And a man who was on his deathbed automatically got well. How could that happen? Wasn't there. Uh, he, the boy looked like he was going to die. He was sick unto death. The only way Jesus from many miles away could heal that man by saying the word is because he's the master of life and death. He has power over life and death, which makes him God. And friend, that's the point John will prove over and over again. You've got the example of the, the paralytic in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. Man's paralyzed, can't do anything, and yet Jesus in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18, he, this man had been paralyzed from birth. He, he, he'd been that way for a long time. And yet Jesus said the word and cured that man. Friend, I want you to think about this again. You take somebody who's paralyzed. In medical science, we've made a lot of advances. There's things they can do to help those people. Not making them walk again. They're paralyzed. They can't walk. Their spinal cord sometimes has even been severed in places. How did Jesus take somebody who's paralyzed, a paralytic, and make them walk? The only way He could do that is He's the master and the creator of the human body and He has power and control over it. Well, who else could that be but God? You take the example of the, here's a great one, the feeding of the 5,000. You've got a multitude of 5,000. You've got a few loaves of bread and a few fish. A little boy who's got a, a few fish and they've got some loaves of bread, just a, just a few loaves of bread and fish. And there's a multitude of 5,000. The disciples say, Lord, they're getting hungry. Should we go into the city? 
and buy food for them. Jesus said, you give them something. And then, of course, they don't know how to feed them. Jesus takes those few fish and loaves of bread. And with just a little bit, he feeds 5,000 people, so much so that they took up more fragments, 12 baskets of fragments, than food they began with. How could Jesus take just a few fish, a handful of fish and a handful of bread and feed 5,000 people? Well, friend, Jesus is the master over natural laws. He has the ability to take that and make more because He is God. Think of this example. What a great example it is. John 6, verses 16 through 21. Do you remember the example of Jesus walking on the water? Jesus uh, comes to them. They think it's a ghost, but He's actually walking on the water, and the disciples are afraid. Now, friend, you think about it. Who can walk on water? I can't walk on water. Gravity, the laws of gravity are in place, and if I try to stand on water, I'm going to sink like a rock, and so would you. And yet Jesus was able to suspend or control those natural laws. It defied gravity for Jesus to walk on water. Well, who can defy gravity but the maker of those natural laws? Jesus walking on water proved He was God. Jesus gave sight to a blind man in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. This man had faced a horrible misfortune in his life, couldn't see, and yet Jesus uh, took that man and made him where he's able to see again. How could Jesus do that? Make somebody who's blind see again. Only God can do that. And then, of course, the most powerful of the seven signs is seen in Lazarus. John 11, verses 1 through 45, Lazarus dies. And, of course, Jesus was close to the family of, of Mary and Martha, and it, it broke Jesus' heart when, Je when Lazarus died. But Jesus said these words. At the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus stood and said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man who'd been dead for several days came out of that tomb bound with tomb clothes. How did Jesus do that? How could Jesus take somebody who was dead, and dead for many days, several days, and bring them back to life again? Friend, that teaches us Jesus is the master of death. And because Jesus, the only way somebody could take somebody, the only way Jesus could take Lazarus and bring him back to life is if he has power over a life and death. And friend, that miracle proves that Jesus absolutely is the Son of God. But you know, not only do the miracles prove it, not only do the titles that Jesus was given by John prove that he was God, but Jesus himself claimed to be deity, claimed to be God by the I am statements that he makes in the Gospel of John. What did Jesus say about himself? John 6, verse 35, when Jesus had taken the, the few loaves of bread and the fish and fed the 5,000, the miracle wasn't the point in and of itself. There was always a teaching lesson to go along with that. And Jesus said this in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. They said, our fathers gave us manna in the wilderness to feed us. Jesus said, wait a minute. You remember that bread? I am the bread of life. He, he who comes to me never hunger, never thirst again, Jesus will later say. Jesus gives complete, complete sustenance and satisfaction. He's the, the source that we turn to for spiritual sustenance in this life. Well, who could give manna? Who could feed these? God. That's the point. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, He's equating Himself and His power with God. Jesus made this I am statement as well. John 8 verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You know, when you think about light, where did light come from? God said, let there be light in Genesis 1, and light came into existence. God is the source of love. He's the source of happiness. He's the source of joy. He's the source of all light and good. When Jesus claimed, I am the light of the world, He was claiming to be divine. He was claiming to be from God and God Himself. Jesus also made this claim. After bringing Lazarus, who'd been dead for several days, back to life, Jesus will make this statement about Himself. 
I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never really die. Friend, do we really understand the importance of what Jesus is saying there? If Jesus had the power to raise Lazarus, and he did, and he claimed to be the resurrection and the life, then friend, he gives life, he revives life, he is the source of all life. His power and his statement demands that he absolutely is God. And then that statement we began with, John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The way to God, the truth of all truth, and the life. Who's the source of all those? Well, whoever, whoever it is must be divine. Friend, that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, of course, in John 15, 1, Jesus will make the claim, I'm the vine. I'm the source from which all good, all fruit, all righteousness comes from. And therefore, again, righteousness being a quality of God Himself. Jesus is God. Now, not only does John claim this, not only do the miracles of Jesus confirm it, his statements prove that as well, but there are also several witnesses. You remember on the Old Testament, at the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word be confirmed? There are seven witnesses in the Gospel of John that John will draw up, not only as proof, but as people who stand to show this is true. Here are those seven witnesses. John 5, verse number 31, the Scripture claims Jesus will say He is a witness. One could stand in witness for Himself, and Jesus claims to be witness on His behalf. And the miracles that He did, the things that He said, the good that He did, shows that He is a trustworthy witness. Then there's another witness. He says, if you don't believe my witness, here's another. John 5, verse 32 through 35 John the baptizer is also a witness. And you remember how people viewed John, right? Everyone viewed John as a prophet. They said in Matthew chapter 21, when, when asked about the baptism of John, they wouldn't answer because they, everybody revered John as a prophet. And so Jesus stands as a trustworthy witness. John, who everybody knew was a prophet from God, he would claim Jesus is divine and He's the Son of God. And so there's two witnesses. Here's the third one, that Jesus is divine. Jesus said in John 5, verse 36, the signs or the miracles that I do, they also are a witness. They claim, they prove I'm the Son of God. Who can walk? When you saw Jesus walk on water, when they saw Him feed the 5,000, when they saw Him bring Lazarus bound hand and foot in grave clothes and everybody knew He was dead, when He healed the lame man or the paralytic, what do those miracles say? They are a, a deafening witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. But then we also have the witness of God the Father. John 5, verse 37 and 38, God Himself is a witness that Jesus is God's Son. Do you remember at the baptism of Jesus? Or excuse me, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Jesus takes Peter and James and John up on that high mountain. He's there transfigured before them. And Peter, because he's scared and he doesn't know what to say, he says, uh, hey, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. How would the Father feel about that? Voice of God boomed down from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear Him. God's witness to the fact that Jesus is divine. God's Son is also God. When Jesus, when God said, this is my Son, He was identifying Jesus Christ as God also. You have the witness of the Scriptures. John 5, verse 39, you look to the Scripture, Jesus said, because you think in them you'll find life, and these are they that testify of me. You look at the prophecies, over and over again, those prophecies point to and are fulfilled by Jesus, and the Scriptures herald the fact that Jesus is God. Moses affirmed it. He said, there's a prophet coming greater than me. John chapter 5, verse 39, Abraham affirms it. John chapter 8, verse 56, before Abraham was... Jesus said, I am. And so these seven witnesses stand as a test for all ages to prove that Jesus is God's Son. And so when you think about the Gospel of John, 
being more unique in some ways or being different and unique in some ways than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John confirms and affirms, testifies, gives witness that Jesus is God. And friend, if Jesus is God, here's the application. Whatever He says, I need to do it. I will one day be judged by the words of Jesus. John 12, verse 48. If I obey Him, I can have eternal life and I can live with God forever. But if I disobey Him and I live in rebellion to that, there are going to be consequences to disobedience to the Creator and the Savior of this universe. And, and God doesn't want men to be lost, nor do we. But friend, those are the applications that we find. D does God want everybody to be saved? You bet He does. Listen to the words of John 3.16. God so loved the world he gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And friend, Jesus told us what we must do to be saved. In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us that one must repent and turn from sin. Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all Likewise perish. We must make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, it was God, Jesus in the flesh, who said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38, And the Lord Himself so plainly said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16 verse number 16. If you've never submitted to God, to Jesus Christ in obedience to the gospel, friend, we're begging you to do that today. Jesus being God means that if I'll obey Him, I'll submit to Him, I'll live my life for Him each and every day, on that grand day, when the final curtain falls and it all comes down to the end, I can have a place with God forever. Friend, God wants you to have that. We want you to do that. Won't you obey the gospel of Christ before it's too late and become a child of Jesus Christ? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111 the Gospel of Christ